Good morning, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Fort Needham Park for the ceremony to com commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Halifax explosion. Good morning. My name is Andel Smith. I am the counsel for District 8 Halifax Peninsula North, and I will act as your master of ceremonies for today's ceremony. Today's event is taking place on Mi'kma'ki, the land of the unceded traditional land of the Mi'kmaq. In a few moments, the Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia will be arriving. On his arrival, the Royal Salute will be played. Please note that this is an unsung tribute to the, the Crown following his honor's arrival. You will be asked to join in the singing of our National Anthem of Canada. At this stage, you will please ensure that your mobile devices are turned off or are placed on silent mode. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome their honors, the Honorable Arthur J. LeBlanc, Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia, and Ms. Patty LeBlanc. Ladies and gentlemen, will you? Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, mesdames, messieurs, bienvenue. The mandate of the Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada is to advise the Government of Canada through the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change on the designation of nationally significant aspects of Canadian history. Designated by the Board as a National Historic Event in 2016, the Halifax explosion, which resulted in some 2,000 deaths and thousands more wounded, had a profound and lasting consequences. After the explosion, rescue efforts began quickly and the city began to recover. The numerous eye injuries, primarily caused by windows shattering as people stood in their homes watching the fire followed by the explosion changed surgical procedures and eye care and provided a major push for the formation of the Canadian National Institute for the Blind. The treatment of burn victims 
many of whom were children, similarly led to advances in pediatric, pediatric surgery. La création du quartier Hillstone suite à l'explosion qui se situe près du fort Needham Memorial Park est considérée comme étant le premier projet d'habitation au Canada. It was the result of reconstruction efforts in this working class neighborhood and is now a national historic district, a very high designation. With the plaque being unveiled today, the board recognizes the tremendous local, national, and international outpouring of support received during the aftermath of the explosion. The plaque will be permanently installed here at Fort Needham Memorial Park to commemorate the national significance of the Halifax explosion. It will be available for viewing at the reception following this event. I invite Andy Fillmore, Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Democratic Institutions and Member of Parliament for Halifax, as well as Mayor Savage, to join me in unveiling the plaque. Thank you. Sorry. At the request of the Mayor of Mayor Savage, Her Majesty, the Queen provided a letter that will be placed in the time capsule. At this time, I ask that Mayor Mike Savage bring word from the Queen Elizabeth, from Queen Elizabeth II, Queen. Queen. Good morning. This is the letter from Her Majesty. As you come together as a community today to mark 100 years since the disastrous explosion which occurred in the Halifax Harbor on Thursday the 6th of December 1917, I want you to know that you are in my own and my family's thoughts. Over the years I have been fortunate to visit Halifax on several occasions and I am always impressed by the remarkable spirit demonstrated by the people of this modern and vibrant city. When this time capsule is opened in 2067, I am sure that Halifax will have continued to grow and to flourish. On this solemn anniversary, I send to the people of Halifax and the wider community my warmest good wishes. Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. moments we will be up we will observe one minute of silence commencing at the exact time of the explosion 100 years ago the moment of silence will begin and end with the striking of the ship's bell Thank you. I would like I would like to introduce the Halifax Regional Municipalities Poet Laureate Rebecca Thomas to the stage.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and those of you who do not ascribe to the gender binary. Welcome to unceded Mi'kmaq territory of Jabuktuk in Sabaganagadi District. It is an honor here to speak this morning. As we remember the Halifax explosion that occurred 100 years ago, I'd like to gently remind you all that history is color-coded, that nostalgia can sometimes be toxic, and that many voices often disappear into the past without ever being heard. It is in this moment that you have a Mi'kmaq woman making opening remarks to introduce a black Nova Scotian poet. We are two people from communities that were not given the same level of care that the white settlers were given 100 years ago when the SS Evo collided with the SS Mont Blanc in the harbor. Africville, severely damaged from the blast, was only given a fraction of the rebuild funds and that white Haligonians were given. Turtle Grove was completely wiped out by the tsunami created by the blast. Those who survived were segregated and kept out of the hospitals. It is only in 2017 that we have monuments that honor our dead. And as we speak, there is a ceremony and walk happening across the water organized by our community. The lives of nine should not overshadow those who died by the thousands. However, with everything we lost in the century previous and the century to come, when we remember those who lost their lives, let's also take a moment to remember the lives of those who at the time weren't valued enough to be deemed considered a loss. It is now an honor for me to introduce our next speaker, the fourth Poet Laureate of Toronto, the seventh Parliamentary Poet Laureate, George Eliot Clark, is a revered artist in song, drama, fiction, screenplays, essays, and poetry. Now teaching African-Canadian literature at the University of Toronto, Clark has taught at Duke Memorial, the University of British Columbia, and Harvard. He holds eight honorary doctorates plus appointments with the Order of Nova Scotia and the Order of Canada. His recognitions include the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Fellows Prize, the Governor General's Award for Poetry, the National Magazine Gold Award for Poetry, to name but a few. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce George Elliott Clark. Good morning. Uh, it's a great honor and privilege uh, to follow Rebecca Thomas and to recite some words to represent the solemnity of this occasion and the celebration of the survival and flourishing of this great city. 8.40 a.m. The first whiff of smoke, white, is inexcusably delicate, like what elects a pope. Out of benzene barrels, monochlorobenzol seeps, wafts, begins to act as Frankenstein science expects, to ignite and go black. The Mont Blanc crew dreads their cargo. It'll erupt in a flash, and Le Medec and Mackie gotta say, save your souls. And the sailors scatter like rats. Sure, rowing like devils for the turtle grove, sure, but not before trying to alert, alarm, emo's men to monkey, mimic, that is to say, scram. The French and Mackie knew an obliterating jolt is on the horizon, itself obscured by tons of hardcore smoke, robust, heaven-curdling smoke, inky, majesty, shifting itself skywards, hundreds of feet, so that the Mont Blanc looks like a smokestack fail. The water, slobbering against the hull, sizzles, Blue water goes negrescent where unignited benzene leaks, liquid jabbers, fire whinnies. The Mont Blanc blaze is spectacular, a crisis, yet far from the hard truth of collision, away from the gashing, gnashing metal and red sparks, yellow flame and black smoke, Halifax Harbor remains placidly, deceptively placid, a million flat cobblestones of light paved water. So the inflamed ship is the sight to see. No gimmicks or hoopla necessary. Nine, 9 a.m., punctual salutations resonate in Richmond homes as spouses trudge to factory or menial jobs. Children troop to school. And many of those cheery kiss cheek goodbyes will prove unknowingly final. But many heads swivel to gape at the upward thrusting, kinky cloud, roiling, seething, demonstrating an internal boiling, venting from a blistering, festering ship drifting toward Pier 6. Laggard lads, 10 o'clock scholars gawp, 
conventional gawkers, hypnotized by streak of flame and smear of smoke, the putrid, turbulent exhaust that is the sea-bound cumulus, yet lovely lavender plumes disgorge from the wrathful, aerated char. Note the skies tinged, absinthe, chartreuse here, gang green there, or rose pink and chocolate there, as if one spying spumboni ice cream spirited into fumes. What's more exuberant than an inferno, the fire department's hurtling engine, Patricia, wants to somehow squelch the boat born fire's gleaming, belching heart, lavishly yellow ochre, immodest as mustard. Who scampers to concrete shelter, seek cold-eyed self-help, trundle goods to cover, waddle with children to a basement or a stronger door, or at the very least turn away from windows? Few ever expect the future, save the Mont Blanc crew, tug tugging madly to Dartmouth's shore, or throw themselves face down on soil and grass, bidding for a hiding place from apocalypse. But Vince Coleman, alert, alarmed, taps out urgent percussive morse, Ammo ship in harbor is fixing for Pier 6. The hooks doomed to detonate. Hold back trains outside Halifax. Yes, this is my last message. Goodbye, boys. Yes, Mont Blanc, self-immolating, makes Halifax now as much a bullseye as shells have made Belgium. 9.04 a.m. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, it is, my now, it is now my pleasure to introduce the Honorable Stephen McNeil, Premier of Nova Scotia, who will offer official remarks on behalf of the province of Nova Scotia. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honours, Your Worship, ladies and gentlemen. Rebecca, thank you uh, for your uh, accurate words, uh, ones that all of us need to uh, continue to keep in mind as we as a province and as a country uh, continue to grow to be all we can be. George Elliott Clark, you are no one, you're, you're a person no one should ever have to follow. I do want to recognize as I stand here, as I'm thinking about 100 years ago today, all of the numbers we all know, you know, 2,000 dead, 9,000 injured, 50,000 people in our city, 25,000 people with a home. But at this very moment, Halifax Police and Halifax Fire, 100 years ago, were heading into this community. Well, many of us, many of our ancestors, were trying to figure out what just happened, whether the war had come to them, whether the unthinkable, what had happened to their children, their families, the men and women in uniform who serve us every day came to our rescue. And I want to acknowledge them as I stand here, as we honor those men and women who came, we honor Vince Coleman and so many other heroes on that particular day who ignored and sacrificed their own life and health to come to rescue the city to this end in the north end of Halifax. Last week I had the great privilege of representing you in Boston so we continue to dedicate a Christmas tree for the people of Boston who come to, came to our aid a hundred years ago. Think about it less than 24 hours fellow citizens in a neighboring country came to help us to put this city back together. People from across Nova Scotia, from across Canada, came to this part of our city. There are defining moments at times when it makes our province and our country. And I've said many times the Halifax explosion was a defining moment for our city and for our province. And I'm going to tell you, out of that devastation, we are sitting in one of the most modern, vibrant cities in this country. And it's because our ancestors, on the day after, in the middle of a snowstorm, got up and said, we're gonna repair what was damaged. We're gonna put this city back together. Our children, our grandchildren deserve nothing but the very best of us to stand here and unite together and come together in a common cause to make sure there's nothing that will deter the human spirit of being able to overcome devastation. 
There is nothing that will overcome the human spirit to continue to move forward. I want to acknowledge all of those who 100 years ago showed that courage, who give us the privilege to be here today, to stand to honor them, to remember the men and women who, were, who lost their lives, for those families who were devastated, to honor and remember those who came to our aid, to support us, to help us come together. Let's, as we remember, and we think about Vincent Coleman and all those others, let's also think about all of the great things that came out since 100 years ago. Let's think about the positivity. Let's think about what we built, what they began to build, and what you and so many other Nova Scotians have continued to build on over this 100 years. Merci beaucoup. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my honor to call upon Member of Parliament for Halifax, Andy Fillmore, to offer remarks on the significance of this occasion. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all here. I know you're not staying dry, but I hope you're staying warm. And I think uh, maybe this morning a little discomfort to remind us of this morning 100 years ago maybe is, is an appropriate thing. I'm uh, honored to be here at Fort Needham Park on behalf of the Honorable Melanie Jolie, Minister of Canadian Heritage, to commemorate this significant historical event. And as every Haligonian knows, the date, December 6th, 1917, is fundamental, foundational to our city's history. In an instant, 2,000 dead, 9,000 wounded, molten iron raining from the skies two and three miles away, and 400 acres of our city erased from the map. And as we are here today on the traditional Mi'kmaq lands, our Mi'kmaq, we have to also remember the Mi'kmaq community at Tufts Cove, known then as Turtle Grove, that was washed away by the ensuing tsunami. Just imagine the wreckage in our city, the physical wreckage, but also the deeply personal and human wreckage that followed. And though it occurred 100 years ago, we still come together to remember it. We still find ways to learn from it, and we're still unearthing the stories of those who experienced it. And today we're here to remember and honor those who passed, and also to think of those who survived and pulled together to build a future, our future, out of the ruins. Through the tragedy, our country witnessed the strength and heroism of the people who called this place home. Ordinary citizens, the Salvation Army, the CNIB, the Red Cross, the men and women of the Canadian Armed Forces and law enforcement, all of them heard the call. Their resilience and tenacity were tested in the worst circumstances through this sudden and destructive event. And their strength shows us the other side of the Halifax explosion, the part of the story that we don't tell enough. And that's the story of our rebuilding, the story of our regeneration. We plucky Haligonians, we came together, we rebuilt our city, and the Halifax spirit is stronger than ever. Notre histoire est marquée de la foi de moments de joie profonde et de moments de grande tristesse. Nos victoires tout autant que nos tragédies en fait de nous ce que nous sommes aujourd'hui. 100 years ago, our city was destroyed, but our community remained intact. Halifax today is a testament to just that. Thank you very much. It is now my pleasure to introduce Rear Admiral Craig Baines, Commander of Maritime's Force Atlantic and Joint Task Force Atlantic. Just... Your Honor, good morning. It's my pleasure to be here today for this ceremony. I'd like to start off by thanking all of you for being here this morning. This morning you got up and you checked the weather and you made a decision to come here anyway and to honor our past. For that, I thank you. It's an honor here to be here this morning to remember this important event in the history of the city of Halifax, the Royal Canadian Navy, and indeed our country. The history and growth of Halifax has always been linked to the sea. 
When the Royal Canadian Navy was founded in 1910, a mere four years before the breakout of the Great War, Halifax was, as it remains today, its largest and most important base. During the war, Halifax rapidly expanded to become a world-class port and one of the most important strategic cities in Canada. Over 285,000 troops departed for the battlefields of Europe from Halifax Harbour. It was the last glimpse of home that many brave souls would ever see. During the war, the Royal Canadian Navy rapidly grew from 350 sailors to two warships to over 9,000 sailors and 130 commissioned vessels. When the U-boats waged an all-out campaign to sink Allied merchant shipping in 1917, the convoy system was adopted to protect the vital flow of soldiers and supplies to the war effort. This increase in the concentration of ships in Bedford Basin and Halifax Harbour set in motion the terrible events of 100 years ago today. Immediately after the collision in the Narrows, Stoker Petty Officer Edward Beard and Acting Boson Albert Madison led a contingent of five other sailors from HMCS Niobe, whose bell is on display here today, in the ship's boat attempting to aid the engulfed Mont Blanc. They were amongst the first victims when the explosion occurred. As many people did that day, they rushed in to help. It was who they were and reflective of the time. I would suggest that not much has changed for the people of Halifax today. While the Great War set in motion the events that would lead to the Halifax explosion, it also helped lay the foundation for the immediate response and recovery. Over 5,000 Canadian and British troops waiting to travel to European battlefields were instead put to work in the aftermath, searching for survivors, rendering aid, and assisting in the cleanup effort. The newly founded Camp Hill Military Hospital originally opened to care for returning wounded soldiers, immediately opened its doors to casualties. 100 years later, Halifax is a thriving city and a place we are all very proud of. Together, we will continue to help the city grow and thrive. The Royal Canadian Navy could not ask for a better place to call home to its East Coast fleet. Thank you very much.